Welcome to the One Cornerstone Online Sermon Podcast, your place to catch up on the most recent messages from Cornerstone. For more great content, check out our videos on our YouTube page and on Facebook at youtube.com slash one cornerstone online and facebook.com slash one cornerstone. But for now, enjoy the message. Well, once again, welcome everybody. If you are brand new to Cornerstone or you've been here a long time, we are so, so very glad to have you. And as we get started, why don't you take a minute and just in the chat feature, let us know where you're watching from. I don't mean your couch or your house. I mean, where are you in the world watching from today as we are worshiping all across multiple states and countries? We would love to connect with you and say hello, especially if this is your first time Mention that you're new and your online host would love to connect with you today. We are in part three of a series called Peace in the Pandemic. And we've been talking for a few weeks about how anxiety specifically, how it tends to come to all of us, but how we can handle it and what we can do with anxiety. How we handle anxiety makes all the difference. It's been said that anxiety is like dying the death of a thousand what ifs. Anxiety is a future fear. It's thinking of what could or might happen and then letting it hang around in our lives for a while. In fact, Skip Heitzig said it like this. He said, if you don't live with an anchor of faith, you will drift in a sea of anxiety. Without the help of God's word, the roots of anxiety will continue to grow in our lives. So this series is hopefully very, very practical. We want to give you the antidote to anxiety, the ways to find peace in the pandemic. And we've been spending time for the past few weeks memorizing Philippians 4, 4 to 7. By show of hands, anybody got the verses memorized? Anybody at home has already memorized Philippians 4, 4 to 7, or at least part of them, right? We've been wrestling the beginning of the key verse. Uh, Last week, we wrestled the beginning of the key verse, verse 6, where the Apostle Paul, who is a preacher who is in prison for his faith, said, don't worry about anything. In fact, here's how those verses read from a translation called the TDT. TDT, Philippians 4, 4 to 7 for the TDT. Here's how they read. Go ahead and blame God. I will say it again, blame God. Let your anxiety be evident to all. The Lord is no longer here. Stress out about everything. The big stuff, the little stuff, the things you can't control, things you wish you could, things that might come true, and things that could never possibly happen. In every situation, see it as an opportunity to complain to other people about how bad you've got it and how everyone else has it better. Allow your envy and your self-focus to blow the problem out of proportion. And don't bother talking to God about it. He doesn't care anyway. And if you continue on this path, the anxiety that exceeds anything we can understand will likely give you ulcers, heart disease, headaches, back pain, and broken relationships. So rejoice and be glad. Aren't you already so encouraged today? I know I am. Now, if you don't know what the TDT is, you've never heard of that particular Bible translation before, it's because I made it up. The TDT is the devil's translation, and it's terrible because it's from Satan. You never want to read that translation. It's never been put into print. It's never going to be. And that is not, not what this passage says. That is just a lot of way, in a lot of ways, the natural result that we end up in if we allow anxiety to hang around in our lives. And perhaps as expected, God has a very, very different perspective than we naturally do when it comes to this stuff. And we would do well to heed the words Paul gives us in the book of Philippians, this book in the Bible in the New Testament, chapter four, where he actually says this. And I want you to say it with me out loud. If you've got it memorized, close your eyes or something and you can, you know, show everybody that you actually have it memorized, right? Philippians chapter four, beginning in verse four. Let's read the whole passage out loud together. Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need 
and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. That's better. That's much better. Those words are not just suggestions. Those words are life for those who choose to believe them and live in them. And we've been using an acronym each week to kind of help us remember what we can do to push the anxiety out of our lives. And if you need to go back, you can watch the services and the messages from the last couple of weeks. And on week one, we said, if we want to have the peace or the calm, C-A-L-M, you start with celebrate. And we don't just celebrate anything. We celebrate who God is and that he is in control and that he's not far away, but he is very near to us. After we celebrate, we said that the A stands for ask. Ask is ask God. He wants us to ask him for help and get super specific about our prayers, not for his benefit, but for our benefit as we are learning more and more to ask specific things of God. L, the L is where we're going to spend time today, and the L stands for list. Make a list of the things that you are thankful for. And the M stands for, maybe you'll find out next week if you join us, all right? You have to be here next week as we wrap up the series. Now, we are focusing today on the second half of verse 6 in Philippians chapter 4, and we are going to be looking at the part where Paul says very clearly, that the, one of the ways to get out of anxiety, he says in the second half, is to thank God for all he has done. To thank God. Gratitude or thankfulness is not just a happy attitude. It is a spiritual weapon against anxiety. It knocks the legs right out from under anxiety. Now maybe you could say it this way, right? Here's another way to say it. Anxiety goes down as thanksgiving goes up. Anxiety goes down as Thanksgiving goes up. It's kind of like hot water on an ice cube. It just melts away anxiety in no time. Why does gratitude, why does Thanksgiving, why do those things have such power against anxiety? Because friends, we can't live in the world of what if and already at the same time. We can't. They can't coexist. Anxiety, if you remember, is about a future fear. A what if that may never happen. We don't know for sure that it will. While Thanksgiving is about present blessing that is right now. It is already in our grasp today. We are thanking God for things and who he is and all that he's given us right now. Now the Gospel of Luke tells us a story. I want to point you to a story that I think is a powerful story about gratitude. It's about Jesus. He has an encounter with 10 men who had leprosy in the Gospel of Luke. In the Gospel of Luke, these guys have leprosy. It's a terrible skin disease. If you know anything about leprosy, it literally rots away the flesh when you get leprosy. And in the first century, it was rampant. The people who had leprosy, they had to be completely separated from society. They weren't allowed to be near anybody else. And Jesus is walking through a town and he encounters 10 lepers. And as he walks by, the lepers cry out to him, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. They're looking for Jesus to do something. They cannot heal themselves. They have no ability to do that. They don't have any of the medication that they would need to deal with the leprosy. And Jesus stops and encounters these 10 lepers. And he tells them to go and present themselves to the priests, the religious leaders of the day. And that's exactly what they would do if they were already cleansed. If they were cleansed of something, then they would go to be reinstated, sort of reinstated spiritually with the priest. So Jesus is saying, I want you to take an act of faith. Go and present yourself to the priest. And the text says in Luke 17, as they went, they were cleaned. As they went, they were cleansed of their leprosy. And of course, they were thrilled. But interestingly, and if you know the story, you know where this is going. Interestingly, only one out of the 10 even bothered to thank Jesus for healing them of not only a terrible life malady, but a life ending disease. They would not heal on their own from leprosy. So let's pick up the story in Luke 17, verse 15, as we look at this for a little bit of context about the power of gratitude, the power of thanksgiving. Verse 15. One of them, talking about the lepers, one of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back to Jesus shouting, praise God. 
He fell to the ground at Jesus' feet, thanking him for what he had done. This man was a Samaritan. If you know anything about the Samaritans, the Samaritans were kind of half-breeds to the, to the Jews. They didn't see them the same way. And so this guy was sort of separated already, ostracized for who he was. Then he had leprosy on top, and he is the one that came back. In verse 17, Jesus asked, Did, didn't I heal 10 men? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give glory to God except for this foreigner? And Jesus said to the man, and I love this phrase, stand up and go. Your faith has healed you. Stand up and go. Your faith has healed you. Now I've heard it said that all 10 men were cleansed by Jesus, but only one of them was truly healed. This guy, the one who was willing to have gratitude. His gratitude and what was happening in his heart where his faith was turning to thank God was bigger than any of the healing the other nine received from their awful disease. Gratitude has that kind of power in our lives. I've told you guys before my favorite grumpy monk joke. Maybe you remember the story about the monk. He went in to the monastery and he had to take a vow of silence. And he was only allowed to speak two words at the end of every year to the head friar. You could go in and you could speak your two words. And then you had two year, a whole year of no words until your anniversary once again. At the end of the first year, he walks into the friar and he says, yes, my son, you've waited one year. You've been here a year. What would you like to say? And his two words were room cold. And after another year, Silence, he, you know, he's, maybe he's growing and learning. He gets there and he goes back to the friar and the friar's hoping for a little bit of a different result. My son, what would you like to say? And he says two words, bed hard. After a third year of complete silence, doesn't say a word the whole year, he goes back to the friar once again. The friar says, what would you like to say? And he says his two words, food bad. Finally, at the end of the fourth year, he came in and the friar said, what would you like to say? And the monk said, I quit. And the friar said, of course you quit. Doesn't surprise me at all. All you've done is complain since you got here. Not exactly a gratitude attitude. Gratitude or thankfulness, says Paul, is an antidote to anxiety. It actually has a way of pressing anxiety out of our life. We find peace when we turn our attention to thanking God for what he has done. And today we're actually, as a church, we're going to take a few extra minutes to be thankful, specifically for one of the gifts God has given us in our world, which is the medical professionals, the healthcare workers, first responders, and especially those today we want to take a special moment to thank those who are frontline workers in our community. We are so, so grateful for you and all of you that have gone above and beyond to serve and love people, many times putting yourselves at risk. Well, earlier this week, I got to take a few minutes and catch up with a few medical workers in our church who are really in so many ways on the front lines and dealing with challenging things to just give me a little bit of perspective as we are praying for folks all across that community. And I got a few minutes to be able to interview them. You're going to get just a segment of our interview. You can find the rest of that on our website or our YouTube page. But here's just a small section of my interview with Ruben and Amber. What would be one or two things that it would be important for the rest of us to need to know or understand about those things? From things that seem small, just saying thank you um, to a message, whether it's a sign, whatever it is, just um, thank everybody for, for their support. I, I feel it. Like I truly have felt the prayers and I feel just an overwhelming sense of calm. I definitely don't know what I'm going into still. It doesn't change my circumstance at the hospital, but I definitely feel the power of prayer and God's presence in this. You know, I have been tested because I, I have um, a potential uh, contact with somebody with uh, COVID. And those 24 hours, maybe 36 hours, were so difficult to deal with when I was waiting for my test to come back. I didn't know what was I going to do with the family and also with work at that time. But it's, it's, it's a difficult time. Should I stay away? Should I just not come home? 
and a lot of people are dealing with that just by going to the hospital and, and, and work. So just praying for that too, for peace of mind. Well, I was really encouraged being able to share with them for a few minutes. And I think you'll be too if you watch that video as we continue to just pray for so many different people who are on the front lines serving in so many different ways. We love you. We pray for you. We're grateful for you. We started today talking about one key antidote to anxiety. It's a way to find peace through the pandemic. And that is making a list of the things that we are grateful for. It is a very, very simple principle that has exponentially huge ramifications if we are willing to actually do it. Maybe you've heard about the legendary basketball coach from Duke University, Mike Krzyzewski, or a lot of people call him Coach K. He's won five national championships and he's one of the greatest college basketball coaches of all time. Now myself, I'm a North Carolina fan, so he is actually like the biggest basketball pain in my life ever, but I still respect Coach K. Now the last time Duke won the national championship was in 2015, and that year, Coach K did an exercise with his team that he actually credits in large degree for their success that year. And what he did is he gave every person on his basketball team, coaches and players alike, a basketball for themselves. And he said, here's what I want you to do. Take a marker and write on that basketball the names of all the people that along the way in your life got you here. As we pursue a national championship, who are all the people that you are carrying with you, in a sense, with your story? It could be a friend who supported you, a teammate who passed the ball to you, a coach that trained you, a parent that sacrificially has taken you to hundreds of basketball practices, been at all your games, cheered for you when you were terrible. I want you to write all their names and carry that ball with you throughout the entire national tournament. And on the bus, in the airplane, in the hotel room, you have that ball. You are carrying them with you. Some of the teammates, supposedly, the report says that they slept with that ball to remind them that they're not playing just for themselves, that they're playing for a wide circle of people all around them that help get them up to that place in their life. What a simple exercise in gratitude. And it changed everything for their perspective. That is what the power of making a list can do. And it's like you're writing things down to help you. Every single thing that you remember to be thankful for is a dagger against the pressures of anxiety in your life. So here's what I want to encourage you to do. Make a list. Actually write down a list of the things that you are thankful for. This is a great discipline as we face individual struggles or situations. It is like medicine to our hearts when we are getting down on ourselves or we're fighting anxiety. It is like medicine to us. Today, we just start by listing some of the things that you're able to say, God, thank you, man. I'm so thankful for the things that I get to be blessed by. And it doesn't have to be on a basketball, okay? Just grab a notebook, write down some of the things that you want to reorient your life around with gratitude and not anxiety. Anxiety goes down as Thanksgiving goes up. Let me show you a little bit about how it works. There's nothing fancy about this, but this is my list that I actually wrote in a notebook. And I'm just gonna share a few of my things with you, okay? First of all, I put on there on my gratitude list and my handwriting's horrible, sorry. My wife and my kids, Morgan and Tate. That's something I'm really grateful for. When, when they caused me some level of frustration or stress and they did once back in 2018, it was a rough moment. I try to remind myself of how completely thankful I am for those three people and the gift that they are to my life. I think of the faithful partner that Nicole is to me, always trying to be supportive of me in ministry and thinking of me first. I think of my friends who prayed and longed for kids but were never able to have birth children of their own. And I think of all the joy that these two bring to my life. I think of all the happy memories that we have together. What a blessing it is to be their husband or dad. That's one of my things on my list. Second thing on my list, my ministry, the opportunities to share the gospel that I have. Now, notice I didn't just say my job, although I'm thankful for that too, and I'm sure you are if you're working. I said my ministry because I am so thankful that I get to share with so many of you the change that Jesus has made in my life and how his words are life. 
and how they can shape your heart if you are willing to trust in him. Another thing on my list, my health and my ability to live a full life. That's something I can celebrate. I'm sick of being cooped up in my house every day and not able to sit in a restaurant or travel or hug anybody, but I'm not going to dwell there. See, the day may come when I don't have health, the health that I have today. Now, many of us are facing tough physical issues, and I am thankful today for the health that I have right now in this moment. I thank God for it. Here's the thing, okay? All of those things that the first three on my list, all of those could go away. And even if they were gone, I still have so many spiritual blessings that I can thank God for every single day. And that isn't just when things are going great in every area. It is quite the contrary. In fact, a little bit further along in the book of Philippians, chapter 4, verse 11, Paul was in a prison cell when he wrote the book of Philippians at the tail end of four years of very unjust accusations being piled up against him. And he writes a little bit further after our key passage. He writes this in verses 11 and 12. Look at what he says in verse 11 and 12. Not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. He says it's a secret to live in every situation, whether it's with much or with little. It's a secret because we struggle to know how to do that. How is he able to find the secret without having everything he wishes in his life? How is he able to thank God because of his focus on gratitude? He has an ongoing list. I don't know if it's on paper, in his head, or where. That he updates daily, regularly, maybe even hour by hour. See, worry and anxiety, they refuse to share the human heart with thanksgiving. They can't coexist. If we let anxiety hang around, we will almost never be content with where we are in life, no matter what things we could or should put on a thanksgiving list. But if we turn our focus to gratitude, everything changes. Now today, some of us are so focused on what we don't have that we forget to focus on what we do have. We're so focused on what we don't have, we forget to thank God for all of the blessings that come with knowing Him or knowing His truths and the promises from Scripture. Here's a powerful truth from Max Lucado. He's the author of the book, Anxious for Nothing, which is a major source for this series. Max Lucado said it like this. He said, what you have in Christ is greater than anything you don't have in life. Man, if you're a Christian, you know that's true. What you have in Jesus, no matter what you face in life, whether you face death, failure, betrayal, sickness, disappointment, none of those things have the power to take your joy if you remember that verse, that phrase, because they can't take away Jesus. And what you have in Christ is greater than anything you don't have in life. In fact, the next verse in Philippians 4, Paul writes these very famous words. You may recognize this verse, Philippians 4, 13. He says, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Tim Tebow writes that verse on his shoes, not because it means he's going to win a national championship or have a powerful NFL career. That dream is over for him. He still believes the verse because the verse means so much to people like Tim Tebow and me and others because of the context we are talking about today. That no matter what we face, when you have Jesus, you have the amazing gifts that he brings into your life every day. You have strength. You have power against anxiety because of Jesus. That is what it means. Did you know that in the book of Philippians, Paul mentions Jesus 40 times in 104 verses, which is once every 2.5 verses. This is a guy who is in prison unjustly, who is saying, let me just make it really clear. The answer to all of this is to thank Jesus. Paul understood something that I just so long for every one of us to understand and really embrace with our lives. That with Jesus, every day can be filled with gratitude. And gratitude can drown out the worry and anxiety that longs to plague our hearts. It's true. Let me illustrate it for you this way. Imagine that one day you're sitting at home 
That's not hard to imagine. And you've never had much in your life. You just, you know, you've got a simple life. You've always been just paycheck to paycheck, barely able to get by. But one day, two men in black suits come to your door and they knock on the door or they ring your video doorbell or whatever. You don't recognize them. Neither one of them is Will Smith. These are not the men in black, just two guys wearing black suits. And you open the door and they say, sorry to bother you, but we are attorneys and we have some bad news for you. But also some good news. Can we come in and share with you what we found out? So you bring them in, you go to the kitchen, you sit down. And they said, we're sorry to tell you the bad news is a distant relative of yours has passed away suddenly. And they name the relative. And while you recognize the name, you didn't even know this distant relative. So the bad news really doesn't shake you up that bad. But then they said, you know, there's good news also. There seems to be an indication that there is a sizable estate. It's complicated, it's spread out all over the place, but you are actually the closest relative and as a result, everything in this estate is left directly to you. To start with, we know that we have $10,000. Here's a check today for $10,000 for you to spend however you'd like. That's the good news. Now, it's all we've been able to find so far, said the men in black. But if you'd like, we can investigate the size of the estate further and we can get back to you if we find anything else. To which you say, by all means, continue to search. If nothing else shows up, you're still $10,000 richer than you were before the doorbell rang that day. So you go spend the $10,000 and you kind of forget about it and you go on with your life. Right? But three months later, doorbell rings again. Same guys in black suits come to the door. And they say, we're back, and we wanted to let you know the estate is actually larger than we thought. There is a home in Hawaii. There's expensive artwork. There are various bank accounts spread all around. And here today is a check for $100,000. And if you'd like, we can go back and keep digging, to which you say, yes, please keep digging. You're doing great. Now, you're carrying that check around the house because $100,000 is more than you've ever had in your life. And you are pretty excited about your $100,000. And you go on and you make some decisions and you move on with your life. Three months later, the guys come up again. And if you didn't have a ring doorbell, you do now. They ring that doorbell. This time, you had coffee and cookies ready because you were excited to see them. And they say, you're not going to believe this. But there are real estate holdings for your relative all over the world, we're finding investments worth millions, millions of dollars. It is a staggering estate. All of it is going to go to you. In fact, here today is a check for $1 million. Would you like for us to continue investigating? And you, of course, say, why not? I've always really loved my extended family. They're amazing. And you're thinking to yourself, how, how long can this go on? First $10,000, then $100,000, then a million. The resources just keep coming. My inheritance is bigger and better than I could have ever, ever dreamed. And just for illustration's sake, imagine that this cycle repeats every three months for the rest of your life. Each time you found out you had actually a greater inheritance than you thought was ever possible. Now, as wild as that story seems financially, Friends, that is a very, very real picture of what happens in the spiritual sense for every person who decides to put their trust in Jesus, to follow him. Remember how it was? If you're a follower of Jesus, you remember? When you first decided to follow him, after realizing that you can't save yourself, that one day you're going to stand before a holy God and you've only got excuses about how you lived your life and why you made certain decisions the way you did. All you've got is a list of excuses. But now you have to face a holy God and you decided you're going to give your life to Jesus. And then you had a savior. You, had, you embraced the one who paid the price for you. And man, you're thrilled. You're not going to hell anymore. Fantastic. We have arrived spiritually. Thank you, God, for saving me. Then two or three months later, you realize, man, the salvation's amazing, but it's not just salvation from, from something like hell. God actually went further and he gave you his Holy Spirit to live inside you, to shape you, to guide you, to help you become holy, something you couldn't ever do on your own. In addition to being saved, now you're learning to trust God. You're learning to 
Let him lead you and teach you and comfort you and empower you and fill you in every way. And man, you can run on that for a while because that is amazing. Then a little bit later, you find out that in addition to the personal presence of God in your life, the very creator of the universe indwelling you, you have been given a new family. Brothers and sisters who also are pursuing Jesus and they're learn, leaning into him and they're following his lead each and every day. And as you get into community with them through groups, through serving, you start building relationships with your new family that sometimes are even more meaningful than any relationship you have ever had in your life. You start serving with your gifts. You start giving back to God. You start even putting God first in your finances and resources because you are overflowing with blessing and gratitude and you are flying high. And then God uses you to serve and to be a witness to somebody else to help them know his truth and his power. Somebody that you care about or that you know becomes just as overwhelmed by the power of God that you had when you first followed him. And you are just blown away that God would use you in that way. And of course, over the years of journey with Jesus, you just keep running into new discovery after new discovery after new discovery. The power of God's word, the blessings of answered prayer, the comfort of God through trials, the wisdom God offers us, the promises all throughout scripture. They just keep going until your heart is about to explode with the riches God has passed on to you and he never stops giving. And you realize one day, you know what? I may never have a house on the beach. I may never have the car of my dreams or millions of dollars in my portfolio. But because of the grace of Christ, I have hope. I'm never alone. Because nothing can separate me from God. Because of Jesus, no matter what I face, I can do all things in Christ. And in my heart and in your heart, I could just not be more grateful. When I forget to, for even a moment and let anxiety creep in, I just start making a list to remind me of all that God has done, all that he is, and all that he's doing. And maybe that's not you today, yet. Maybe today, wherever you are, you need to accept the free gift of Jesus and decide to walk in truth with him. Maybe wherever you are today, you need to have a conversation to say, I want to find that kind of freedom. I want to live my life in gratitude and experiencing the inheritance and the richness of God every single day. We have a number we'd love for you to text and just let somebody get a hold of you. Start a conversation. Maybe mention it on the chat room and with your online host. We would love to help connect with you. And if you're like me and you've been walking in that for a few minutes, can we just take a moment and pray together as a church family all across this community, all across the world, and thank God for what he has done in our hearts and our lives. Would you pray with me? Lord God, there's no words that can express the gratitude that we have to you. There, there's really not enough paper. There's not enough room on our notes app. There's not enough prayers that can be prayed to thank you, God, for who you are, what you've done, and how you meet us exactly where we are every single day. We are so grateful. And God, may our lives be turned to gratitude. May our hearts be turned to thankfulness. May everything that we do, Lord, and when the anxiety comes to creep in, when we run into trials and difficulties, Lord, remind us in that moment of all the ways your promises are true and let us be thankful, God, to knock down the anxiety that wants to creep in and find peace in the midst of the pandemic. We praise you, God. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for listening. We'd love to connect with you. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and on YouTube by searching One Cornerstone Online. You can also find more information about us at our website at onecornerstone.org. 